Traveler is a very compelling and very human story of a man whose deep childhood trauma, the loss of his father at the age of 10, propelled him towards scientific achievement, pushed him to the point where he wants to go back into time. Up next, Dr. Ron Mallett on Coast to Coast AM. Dr. Ronald Mallett, professor of theoretical physics at the University of Connecticut. Professor Mallett's breakthrough research on time travel has been featured extensively in the media around the world, including the history, learning, and science channels. Professor Mallett's recently published memoir, Time Traveler, very compelling human story of a man whose deep childhood trauma drove him to a quest to build a time machine and is is, uh, to be made into a feature film by director Spike Lee. And I'm going to let Professor Mallett tell his story. And Ron, it is always a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you? Fine, George. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be back. What a quest. I bet since the last time we talked, which was almost a year ago, you're getting a little closer. (laughs) <laughs> well, we, we're getting closer as far as, uh, you know, design. Uh, as far as finances, however, it's still small. I mean, what, it's been wonderful because the general public uh, has been contributing. I mean, the project has been authorized under, by the um, UConn Foundation, so uh, contributions are tax deductible. However, um, what we need is wider publicity so that we get uh, – a major philanthropic bank, uh, you know, partner who would be willing to uh, help uh, the project in a major way, and uh, that's what we're looking for: is someone who's willing to um, take uh, this type of research to uh, the next level, so that uh, you, we could bring time travel, the whole idea, um, into reality. Bill Gates, if you're listening, pull it off. He could do it, couldn't he, Ron? Well, yes, Bill Gates could. That would be uh, one of the uh, major philanthropic partners that uh, I have in mind, definitely. Fantastic. And, uh, and to think about, I mean, uh, the thing is, is that we're talking about something that contributes to, could contribute to really uh, helping mankind move to the next level. So uh, it would be worth it. Tell me about this 10-year-old youth, Ronald Mallett. What happened then? Well, I... It's interesting. I mean, everything that I am, everything that I've done, started with a tragedy that happened in my early life. Uh, my, I was the oldest of four children, and my father was a television repairman, and he was uh, very successful at what he did, and he was uh, also very successful as a family man. I mean, he spent an enormous amount of time with us, even though we worked two jobs, and I always felt that I was the center of his attention. And I really uh, loved him very much. But he had an extremely weak heart, and we didn't know it. And suddenly he died of a massive heart attack, and he was only 33 years old. This is when I was 10 years old. And as I said, he was the center of my world. And I, it, it, I was crushed. I mean, I just sort of collapsed into a black hole emotionally. And I would have stayed that way if it hadn't been for the fact that I loved to read science fiction and about a year after he died, when I was 11 years old, I came across H.G. Wells' classic, The Time Machine. And uh, that became my life preserver. That, that actually gave me a ray of hope because I thought, this is it. This is the solution to the, my problem. I, if I could build a time machine, I could go back and see him and tell him what was going to happen and, and save his life and change things. So uh, it became uh, my obsession to build a time machine to try to see him again. That was the beginning for me. And uh, fortunately, uh, I love to read even beyond science fiction. Yeah. And I came across about a popular book about a year after that when I was about 12. Uh, I could only afford to get books at the Salvation Army, but I got a paperback <laughs> that was uh, called uh, The Universe and Dr. Einstein. And in that paperback, and I could tell that it had something to do with time because it was actually an hourglass with Einstein standing next to it on the cover. So I, so I, I, I figured that this had to do something with time. And when I was leafing through the book, it, it looked like it was saying that this genius Einstein said that uh, time wasn't fixed, that time, in fact, could be altered by motion and things. I, I didn't clearly understand what was being said, but I knew that it said that um, – it, this genius Einstein said that time could be changed, and this is something I had to know. So Einstein became the second obsession in my life, and I knew that if I could figure out what it is that he had to say, then this would be the solution to my problem of uh, building a time machine. So those two things, H.G. Uh, Wells, 
uh, Time Machine and, uh, and Einstein became uh, the two pillars that uh, formed the uh, foundation, you know, for my life. And, and and you pushed yourself. I mean, it wasn't easy being, a, you know, a 10-year-old and your father's gone and you had to push your life to accomplish your goals. Yeah, you know, it was also a time in this country, you're, you're African-American, where it wasn't easy for you to get to where you did without pushing. And, it, 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 you know, it's just the cards weren't dealt in your favor at the time, and you, and you made it work for yourself. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, in fact, that's, that's very important. After my father died, I mean, we went into poverty. Uh, my mother, as I said, I was the oldest of four. Uh, the youngest was, was four years old. And uh, my mother, she was a very strong woman, and um, it's a miracle that she was able to keep us together. Uh, even though she had a high school education, she was not able to get anything but the most menial uh, jobs, and it was extremely difficult for us. Um, but, uh, you know, we survived. I mean, I did everything that I could to, uh, to feed my book habit from, uh, you know, uh, shining shoes to, uh, um, I mean, just everything. I, 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 uh, that was the thing that also saved me was the fact that I went into this world of fantasy in order to, uh, in order to survive. And uh, going to college was definitely not something that was automatically in my future. But um, in a sense, I was able to follow my father's footsteps. He used the GI Bill. He, he uh, was a battlefield medic in the Second World War. Uh, and he used okay. the GI Bill to uh, become a uh, television technician. And so I had the idea of going into the service. This was during the Vietnam era. To, um, and the idea was to save the money after high school and um, then eventually go to college. And so that's, that's what I did. I went to the Air Force, and I was a computer technician in the Air Force. And the GI Bill was um, brought back again because of the Vietnam War. And that was the reason why I was able to go to uh, college. And I went to Penn State after um, I got out of the service, and I got my bachelor's, master's, and Ph.D. in physics and um, in theoretical physics uh, at Penn State. And uh, it's, it's interesting, though, uh, you know, it's, things have changed. At, at the time when I was uh, working on this, uh, I didn't tell anyone about my interest in time travel and mm -hmm. wanting to build a time machine uh, because I was really worried about what people might think about, you know, I think, I knew that they might think I was crazy, even as a child. <laughs> and throughout my career, I did the same thing. And the thing is, is that it, you know, there's another aspect of uh, of becoming a physicist that, uh, as an African American, that was difficult. And that is to say that there were many, um, sadly, even within the uh, physics community. I have to say that most of the people, this was not so. Most of the people in the physics community felt that anyone who had the drive and the intellect to achieve and become a physicist, but there were some, and uh, unfortunately one was a major Nobel Prize winner. Uh, his name was uh, William Shockley, who um, he was co-inventor of the transistor, uh, so very brilliant physicist, but he felt that uh, African Americans were intrinsically, intellectually inferior, and oh. that, uh, believe it or not, and uh, so this, but this, rather than discouraging me, this, made me feel even more that, uh, you know, I was going to prove people like that wrong, that it was possible for uh, an African-American to achieve anything in any field, and, um, and then even in an intellectual area like physics. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't automatic. And when I got my Ph.D., I was, it was at the time I got my Ph.D., this was 1973. There was about um, 20 those are, those are still tense times in this country. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was about 20,000 uh, Ph.D. physicists in the country at that time. And uh, I was only one of 79 um, African-American Ph.D.s out of that. So it was not something that was, um, you know, I would say that um, they may have felt, as I did, that um, it was not something that was uh, encouraged, except for a few in the field. And I have to say, my thesis advisor, Gordon Fleming, was one of those. I mean, he was colorblind, and he uh, just felt that as long as you, uh, you know, knew what you were doing, that's all that was required. But uh, it was it was difficult times. I mean, things things have changed in many ways, but still, yeah. there's a lot of uh, problems that uh, we have in this country, and well, I think yes. that was one of the things that Spike Lee uh, was hoping to uh, to help change. And well, has I, some of his movies too. 
And I'm sure your family's very proud of what you've done, and uh, you know we're just uh, delighted that you continue to uh, come on this program to talk about a subject that is uh, uh, so dear to all of us. I mean, uh, we live for time travel on this show, Ron. <laughs> I want to. I want to go back with you and meet your dad. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's incredible. Tell me a little bit about how the mindset for time travel. Uh, it began in terms of what direction you looked at. I mean, you're a physicist. I wouldn't even know how to start to build a time machine or even think about it. You can. How did that? How did that mindset start? Well, the, the mindset really is the fact that um, time is not. You know, we we think of some time as being something that just seems to move independent of us. I mean, we we find ourselves embedded in change. I mean, um, you know. Time is something that happens in a way independent. Seasons change, people change, you know, and time is really an intrinsic feature of our physical world. And it's and, and I should emphasize, you know, time is independent of whether we have a name or for it or not. It's not a, a construct of human beings. I mean, it happened before, um, you know, human beings came into existence. There was time. Uh, but the thing is, is that physics has a way of actually quantifying time in terms of, you know, what's measured by a clock. But that doesn't mean that time is the same thing as a clock, but that gives us a way of measuring the rate at which time flows, if you will. And, uh, and that's important because in classical physics, nothing can change the rate at which time flows. That is to say that a clock ticks at the same rate no matter whether you're standing still or whether you're moving. And that's important to remember that that is the classical mindset. What changed everything was Albert Einstein. Einstein, and because of the fact that physicists have a way of, of quantifying time, was able to show that time, in fact, the flow can be altered. The flow does depend on how you move. And on a clock, if it is moving, the rate at which time flows is different than a clock that is at rest. And a clock that it's moving, time slows down. And uh, as I said, that was a revolution because uh, that doesn't seem to be the way in which we see things in the everyday world. But what's important is, is that there is a way of actually measuring that this is so. And that's important because physics is basically something that is based on experiment. That is to say, Einstein created, he was a theoretical physicist, and he developed the theory that said that a moving clock time when a moving clock slows down. But this was verified by experiments. And um, one of the most recent experiments that um, many people aren't aware of shows that, in fact, time travel into the future is something that is a reality. Uh, what the experiment was done at the Naval Observatory in the early 70s. It's called uh, the Heifel Keating experiment, but uh, basically what it is is that uh, two atomic clocks, which, as you know, are the most time precise timekeeping right. mechanism that we have. Uh, one of the atomic clocks was kept stationary at the Naval Observatory, and the other atomic clock was put on an ordinary passenger jet and flown around the world uh, close to the speed of sound. When they brought the passenger jet back, they found that the time on the passenger jet, on the atomic clock, the clock had actually lost time. It had slowed down hmm. compared to the clock that had been arrested exactly as Einstein had predicted in his theory of relativity. And I should say that the theory, uh, he developed two theories. This particular theory that uh, predicted that time slows down for a moving clock is called the special theory of relativity. And um, if one wanted to have a sort of a, you know, a rapid way of thinking of a special theory of relativity, that it deals with speeds that... Uh, well, let's say the speed of light. The speed of okay. light is sort of the ultimate speed limit in the special theory of relativity. And what Einstein showed was what happens whenever you start moving at different speeds relative to the speed of light. And uh, now I should mention that this slowing down that occurred for the passenger jet was uh, measurable, but was only fractions of a second because even though we're going at the speed of sound, compared to the speed of light, the speed of sound is very, very Slow. Exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, if we think of uh, Mach numbers, you know, Mach is the speed of sound. Uh, one, you know, one Mach one, one is, Mach. is right, and, and if you talk about two Machs, that's you know twice the speed of sound. Okay. So if we want to measure the speed of light in terms of the speed of sound, it, 
speed of light would be a Mach a million. Oh, gosh. That's, okay. that's, that's traveling. <laughs> that's traveling, exactly. Uh, so in any case, I mean, a beam of light would go around the world about 10 times in one second. So that, that's, uh, that's fast. In any case, so as, as we go faster and faster and faster, we've been able to see that this effect uh, happens uh, on a more dramatic scale. And as a matter of fact, in um, particle colliders, they're able to speed up particles that only live for a very short period of time. They're able to speed them up close to the speed of light. And what they've been able to find is that the lifetime of these particles, which normally is very, very short, it can be cr increased uh, 8, 16 times longer. So the particles actually live longer. What this effectively means is that these particles are traveling into the future. And the people, was, and once again, um, the people on the passenger jet, because they were moving faster, they actually were traveling fractions of a second in the future. And the reason why, if you think about why that's so, that is what we really mean by time travel, if you think about it in the, uh, even in terms of the science fiction movies, because a time traveler leaves the normal time stream and they travel to the future, and they arrive, they are younger than everyone around them. That's right. Okay? That's right. And so this means that uh, when you travel fast enough and time slows down for you, you actually arrive in the future younger than everyone else. And so that is what we mean by time travel in the future. So once again, that's what I mean when I say that time travel in the future has already been seen and already been measured, and, uh, and that verifies what happens in the special theory of relativity. Now, for no. me, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, for me, of course, the, uh, my interest was not just time travel to the future, but going the other way, you know, time travel to the past. And uh, you can't do that within the special theory of relativity. You, you can't do that. That would mean that you would have to be able to go fast in the speed of light, and there's a law of physics that prevents you from even reaching the speed of light, let alone going fast in the speed of light. Uh, and that light barrier, incidentally, I should mention, has nothing to do with, uh, uh, it's not like the sound barrier where, you know, this is just simply a, a hang-up of physicists and eventually it would be broken, like the sound barrier was broken. It's actually built into the way in which things are. Um, and there's an easy way of seeing why that, uh, that barrier is there and can't be broken. It has to do with the fact that uh, uh, the very famous equation equals MC square, yeah. uh, in which... Uh, the E in that equation stands for energy, and the M in that equation stands for mass, and the C stands for the speed of light. Okay? What that equation says is that, uh, as we well know from the atomic bomb, that a little bit of matter can be converted into an enormous amount of energy. But the equation can be read in the other way, too. That is to say that energy, pure energy, can be converted into matter, into mass. And so what happens is, is, is that as we apply energy to an object to speed it up, some of that energy actually goes into increasing the mass of the object. So mm -hmm. the object actually becomes more massive, and that means that it becomes harder to speed the object up. What you find is that eventually, in order to get an object to go at the speed of light, you would have to give it an infinite amount of energy. So that's, that's the reason count. why that... Uh, you know, it's not possible to do it that way. However, there's, there's got to be a way if you're going to go back is, to see your right, dad. That's right. And the way for me, fortunately, was Einstein's second theory, uh, which incidentally took him 10 years beyond his first theory. He developed. Let's, let's first... talk about that, Ron, when we come right back. We're going to take this break with our guest, Professor Ron Mallet, Ph.D., his story, Time Traveler. Eventually, it'll be a movie. We can all go and see it. We'll be back in a moment. Uh, what a fascinating discussion with Dr. Ronald Mallett. We're going to talk more about time travel and also exactly how is he going to build this time machine. If you are not a member yet of Streamlink, just get up to the coasttocoastam.com website for pennies a day. You'll be able to get podcasts and some downloads, and it's just a great feature to become part of Coast to Coast AM. It's called Streamlink, and it's at coasttocoastam.com. And welcome back to Coast to Coast with Professor Ron Mallet. Ron, so the first theory we were talking about of Einstein's two theories, special uh, theory of relativity, uh, was the speed and everything else. And then That's there's right. what, the general theory? That's right, the general theory. And uh, you should mention that the special theory was developed by Einstein in, in, when he was 26 years old in 1905. Uh, in order to develop the 
general theory of relativity, it took him 10 years. He didn't develop it until his middle 30s. And the reason for that is the whole new level of complicated mathematics that he had to learn in order to, to do that. Um, and the reason why, I mean, it wasn't just that he sat down and said, well, I, I think I'm going to develop the general theory of relativity. The reason for developing it in the first place and, uh, was to overcome that problem that was associated with the special theory of relativity and had to do with gravity. Um, when Einstein tried to apply his theory to everything, every, it, with everything else was able to, uh, to come into it, but gravity resisted. And uh, it, there's a very simple way of seeing the problem that he was faced with and why he had to overcome it and, um, and why that ultimately leads us to a whole new way of looking at time. And it has to do with uh, uh, the simple problem of, uh, let's say, our Earth orbiting the sun. Um, you know that the Earth is orbiting the Sun due to the gravitational pull that the Sun exerts on the Earth. And, uh, you know, we're about 93 million miles away from the Sun. And uh, it takes light eight minutes to travel from the Sun to the Earth. Now, let's suppose that uh, we were unfortunate enough to have some cosmic catastrophe, uh, like a des destruction of the Sun somehow. Well, what will we see? And I'm using that word in a very definite way. What will we see? Well, it would take a full eight minutes for the light to travel from the sun to the earth. So that means that we would actually see the sun out there in the sky for eight minutes, even though it had been destroyed. That's right. Okay. However, according to the old theory, the classical theory of gravity of Newton, gravity would shut down immediately. So you would have the following weird effect. We would see the sun out in the sky, but since gravity was shut down immediately, that would mean that we would be hurtling off in space. So we would still see the sun out there, but we wouldn't know why we were going off into space, okay? Because we, it would to look like the sun is still there and should be keeping us in orbit. So what this meant is, is that gravity was actually traveling faster than the speed of light. And Einstein said nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, even gravity. There's a problem. But what he found was that in order to get a, to solve that problem, he had to develop a whole new theory of gravity, in which gravity is no longer a force, but gravity actually acts like the a medium, or space acts like a medium that looks to us like gravity. And there's a very simple way of actually thinking about what I'm saying and how that could be represented. Okay. Suppose that you have uh, something like a, a trampoline. Okay, just a, a rubber sheet, like a trampoline. And think of that rubber sheet of the trampoline as being like empty space. Now, suppose that what you do is you take a bowling ball and put it on the rubber sheet. What, it's, what is the bowling ball? It's, it's it's push, it sink. Right. It push, so push pushes the rubber it down. Sheet, right. Now, suppose you took a little marble and you put it at the edge of the rubber sheet. Now, due to the fact that the bowling ball is pressing down, the rubber sheet, that marble is going to roll along that depression until it hits the bowling ball, right? That's right. That's right. Okay? And, in fact, if you were to give that marble a little bit of a sideways motion, like, you know, you just throw it a little sideways, it would start going around the bowling ball like, like a, a skater on a roller derby ring. Un until it hits it. Until, right. Now, the thing is, is that in Einstein's theory, now suppose, however, that the... the um, rubber sheet were transparent so that all you could see was the bowling ball and the marble okay all right. then when you toss the marble in the marble would go around and around the bowling ball but it would seem as though somehow it's the bowling ball that's keeping the marble in orbit around right. it right. but what you actually know is happening is, is that the rubber sheet is being pressed the right down around the and that's what's actually keeping the marble moving around, okay? Well, what Einstein said is that is all that gravity is. In other words, the sun is bending the empty space around it. Even though we can't see it, it's bending ah. the empty space just like the bowling ball is bending the rubber sheet. And the earth is moving around that depression that's created by the sun, okay, in the same way that the marble is moving around the bowling ball. Okay, so, now wh why, for example, the planet, and we'll get right back to this, but how, I, I'm, now I'm curious, why doesn't the planet 
like that marble eventually hit the sun. Well, that's be right, because with the uh, sheet, there's friction. There's no friction of space. Okay, okay. So, in other words, if that rubber sheet didn't have friction... It would between, keep going around and around. Right, exactly. Okay. okay. The marble would just keep going round and around and around. But it's because of the friction that it goes in. But in the space that's being bent, the Earth is not experiencing any friction moving around. So the Earth just keeps moving around and around and around, okay, just like the marble would on a frictionless rubber sheet. Okay. okay. So, so what Einstein said is, is that what we call the gravitational force is really an illusion. It's actually the curvature of space, the bending of space, just like that bending of the rubber sheet. In other words, the sun is bending the empty space around it just the way the, the bowling ball would be bending the rubber sheet. So, but we think of it as a force because we can't see that bending of the empty space. And now, you, how, you might say, well, how does this explain that, that problem that we were talking about originally, where, you know, if the sun were destroyed, it would take eight minutes? Well, suppose that you destroy the sun. What would happen is, is that, let's go back to the rubber sheet. Let's suppose that all of a sudden, somehow, I, I pulled the bowling ball rapidly off the rubber sheet. What's going to happen? There would be a vibration of the yeah. rubber sheet. And that vibration would take time to get to the marble, okay? Well, what happens is, is that if the sun were destroyed, there would be actually a vibration of space. That vibration of space is sort of like a gravity ripple, okay? And that if, and what you, if you calculate the time that it takes for that effect to get from the sun to the earth, it turns out that it takes eight minutes. So in other words, that ripple of gravity takes the same time as light. So if the sun were somehow destroyed, by a cosmic catastrophe, not only would we see the sun out there for eight minutes, but it would be eight minutes before the change in gravity would reach us. I see. Okay. <laughs> so that's how we solved that problem. But now what Einstein also found was that this bending of space also affects time. What he found was is that the bending of space leads to a bending of time, and that bending of time shows up to us as a slowing down of clocks. In other words, what Einstein found is, is that the more space is bent, the more time is bent, and the more the time is bent, the more time slows down. So remember that in the special theory of relativity, it was speed that caused time to slow down. In the general theory of relativity, what Einstein found out is that Gravity also can cause time to slow down. And the stronger gravity is, the more time will slow down. What this means that is that here at the surface of the Earth, where gravity is stronger than, let's say, at high altitudes on top yeah. of a mountain, time will actually run slower than at a higher altitude. Now, you might say, wait a minute, has, have we seen this? As a matter of fact, not only have we seen it, it actually has practical everyday consequences. Why? In terms of the GPS satellites. That is to say that on the GPS satellites, there are clocks, okay? And those clocks, what we have, what engineers have to take this into account, as a matter of fact, it turns out that the clocks on the GPS satellite, because they are at such a high altitude, those clocks are found to run faster than the clocks here at the surface of the Earth. That is to say, the clocks here at the surface of the Earth are actually running slower than the clocks in the GPS satellites. Corrections have to be made for this. If they weren't, we would not be able to use them to find our correct location here at the surface of the Earth. So this effect of gravity on time is something that we have seen. We know that Einstein was right, that gravity slows time down. And this actually was important to me because this meant that there might be another way that one could use gravity in uh, or use time that if one could control gravity, then somehow one could control time. And it turns out that there is an object in our universe that controls gravity in an extreme way, and we control time in an extreme way. That object is called a black hole. Yes, okay. Okay, and a black hole, to remind you, is just simply a star, you know, like our sun, uh, only a little bit more massive, but... Uh, these stars, what happens is every star, uh, eventually, it uses a fuel like hydrogen that it burns to form helium. And
and that gives the internal energy that gives us the the heat and light and everything oh, from our yeah. sun, okay? But that energy that's inside the sun is balanced against the gravitational attraction of the gases of the sun. The gravitational attraction of the gases of the sun want to pull the sun inward, whereas the energy inside pushes outward. So our sun is in this delicate balancing act between the internal energy pushing outward and the gravity pulling inward. Eventually, that internal energy will be used up in terms of our sun in about 5 billion years, and uh, different for other stars. But if we're talking about stars that are more massive than the Earth, what will happen is, is that when they've used up their internal energy, they will start to collapse because there will be nothing to keep them from, from uh, you know, pushing out. They will start to pull inward. And what happens is, is the gravity around that star will start escalating. It will be more and more and more intense. And eventually what will happen is, is that the gravity around the star, as the star collapses, will become so intense that the very light itself that tries to get away from the star will actually get pulled back to the star. So if you're standing outside of the star and all of that light is getting pulled back to the star, then what do you see? Nothing. Because Nothing. all the light is being sucked it's back sucked to the star. Right. That's what we mean by a black hole. A black Ronnie, hole is nothing... Well, if if you're able to go into that black hole and not get mm -hmm. ripped apart, for right. example, how far, theoretically, could you go into it? I mean, and what are you going into and what do you come out of if well, you don't get ripped apart? Well, the thing is, is that, number one, uh, there's no way that you're not going to get ripped apart. As you, as you go in, you might not feel it initially. I mean, you might start uh, – what – what happens is, is that once you go on the other side of the black hole, remember what I said about the fact that light is being pulled in, all right? Yes. Then remember what Einstein said about light. Nothing can travel faster than that, right? right? So if you decide all of a sudden that, well, I've changed my mind. I want to get out of this thing, okay? Well, since light can't get out, you can't get out. You're so stuck in there. You're stuck in there. And so you get actually pulled towards the center of the black hole. Now, what happens as you're getting pulled to the center is still open because people, we've never been able to get inside of a black hole. But there's various, uh, one of the scenarios that occurs is the fact that we, we get pulled and get, as we're going towards it, we will actually get ripped apart due to tidal forces. That is to say that even here on the Earth, because our feet are closer to the center of the Earth in our head, that gravity is pulling more on our feet than on our head. Yeah. And we don't notice it. However, if you're on the other side of a black hole, that effect becomes extremely exacerbated. And as you're going towards the center of the black hole, your feet start accelerating at such a rapid, great rate uh, relative to your head that you feel tidal forces across your body that would rip your body. It, it would actually shred you uh, because your feet would be accelerating, you know, more than your head. Is there and any way around that, or this is what's going to happen? And that's this the is way what's going to happen, and there's no way you can turn around and get back out. I mean, so okay. you don't want to get inside of a black hole. Uh, now, I, I should mention that that there is a ray of hope if you're dealing with rotating black hole, because it turns out that rotating black holes are a little different than just standard black holes that don't rotate. Uh, that is to say that if you go in the right way towards a rotating black hole, uh, you might be able to go by the limb of it without getting uh, stuck in it. But mm -hmm. with an ordinary non-rotating black hole, you are history once you get on the other side of it. However, the thing is, is that before you get to that particular point, okay, just as you get near the black hole, if you don't go in, you will still be able to find some dramatic effect on time because remember I said that according to Einstein, the stronger gravity is, the more time will slow down. So if you got close enough to the edge of the black hole without falling in, time for you. Now, when I say time for you, I mean that someone standing outside the black hole and looking at your clock, okay, as you're near right. the black hole, they would find that your clock would start slowing down to a point where it would come nearly to a halt. So time near the edge of the black hole would come nearly to a halt. And so as you, as they are watching you, you would appear to age less and less and less. And so in a sense, a black hole can be thought of as a natural time machine because if you get close enough without going in, uh, you may only age for hours. However, hundreds of years could be passing for everyone else. And as long as you didn't get inside the black hole, 
if you moved back away from the black hole, you would find that, um, as I said, you have traveled into the future, into the distant future, by getting close to a black hole. Now, this is the reason why I started studying black holes, because what I realized was that by studying black holes, I could study about time uh, and not let on that I was trying to build a time machine. So I built my career mainly around studying black holes. Now, and, will, uh, will your time machine, Ron, be based on these theories that's that right. you've on, just on Einstein's discussed? Einstein's general theory of relativity. As a matter of fact, that's the core of my work is based on Einstein's theory of gravity. Without Einstein's theory of gravity, I would have gotten nowhere. And my work is based on uh, the fact that gravity can be thought of as a medium, not as, you know, it's a property of space and not as, as a, a force. That's the core of my idea. And I could actually explain pretty simply how my theory works using sure. Einstein's theory. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is to use the property of space that... Um, is it can be affected that space can actually get twisted by circulating beam of light. In other words, what I found, and this is, is that light, and you have to remember now, this is uh, in all Newtonian theory, the only thing that can create gravity is matter, okay, solid matter, like the, uh, the sun creates the gravitational force which keeps the earth in orbit, the earth creates the gravitational force which keeps us, you know, on the surface and so on. But in Einstein's theory, not only can matter create gravity, but light can create gravity as well. And that's the core of my idea. In fact, you can begin to see how my reasoning went, right? I said, you know, well, gravity can affect time, okay? Right. If light can create gravity, then light can affect time. Exactly. Okay? So that was the reasoning that I utilized. And as I said, it was anchored in Einstein's theory. And what I found was that if you create a circulating beam of laser light, and there's a number of different ways that you can get a laser light to go around and around in a circular path. It doesn't have to be a form of a circle, circle just as long as you get the light beam going around in a circle. You can bounce it off mirrors or have intersecting light beams. But you can create the effect of light going around in, in, a, in a circulating path. Does it have and, to be big or small? Right? Well, the effect depends on, I mean, the, it turns out that the effect is more dramatic and becomes greater the smaller the circulating smaller. path that you okay. create. Yeah, and then I'll come back to that. But the thing is, is that uh, the if you think of the circuit, and this is the way in which you can think of how the effect works, think of empty space as being like coffee in a cup. This is the analogy I like to use. Okay, so think about, let's imagine you have a cup of coffee in front of you. All right, let's hold it right there, Ron. We'll come right back. We're at the... Uh, doesn't Professor Mallet make it easy to understand time travel? And there's more to come right here on Coast to Coast AM. Ron, you were talking to us about a coffee cup analogy. Right, right. Okay. It was an, right, an analogy with, uh, you know, how one can actually affect space and time. Um, and the idea is to, uh, once again, as I said, this is anchored in the notion of Einstein that uh, space can be thought of as a medium. And if you think of the coffee, as I said, imagine that you have a cup of coffee in front of you and think of the coffee in the cup as like empty space, representing empty space. And if you think of the spoon as representing the circulating light beam, and as I said, that that's something that one can create when you get a laser beam to go around in a circulating path. Now, if you take the spoon and stir the coffee, what happens to the coffee? The coffee starts swirling around. Well, it turns out that the circulating light beam will do the same thing to empty space. That is to say that as the circulating light beam goes around, it will actually stir empty space the same way that the spoon stirred the coffee. Now, you might say if it's empty space, you know, how are you going to see it uh, getting <laughs> stirred around? Well, if you, let's go back to the coffee and suppose that I put a sugar cube in there. Then as I stir the coffee around, the sugar, the coffee is going to be dragging the sugar cube around. So I could see the effect of the coffee swirling around by just looking at the sugar cube because as the coffee moves it around, you know, I'll see it. Well, the thing that plays the role of the sugar cube uh, in the empty space would be a subatomic particle that's called a neutron, which is a part of, of every atom. Uh, 
That's and right. if I put the neutron into the empty space, then as the circulating light beam stirs the empty space, the empty space will drag around the neutron, just like the coffee dragged around the sugar cube. So that even though I can't directly see the empty space being dragged around, just by looking at what's happening to the neutron, I can see that the neutron is getting dragged around by the empty space. So that particular, incidentally, that effect that I'm talking about is technically called frame dragging. It means that the frame of reference of the particle is being dragged around. Okay, so this is one of the predictions that I had from my uh, theory, is that a circulating light beam will cause this dragging of space, or space twisting, I sometimes call it also. And that's, incidentally, a brand new prediction in and of itself. Now, wow. The, uh, and that's the core of my idea. Now, the thing is, is that in Einstein's theory, remember what I said earlier, that uh, what Einstein found is that whatever it is that you do to space also happens to time. Remember, the bending of space led to the bending of time, which right. showed up as the slowing down of time. Well, this happens here, too. This this twisting of space will actually eventually lead, if, if the twisting is, is violent enough, strong enough, will lead to a twisting of time as well. And the way of thinking about this twisting of time is that imagine that you take a piece of paper and, and on that paper draw a straight line that will represent a timeline. And at the bottom of that line, put yesterday, the past. At the middle of that line, put today, the present. And at the top of that line, put the future, tomorrow. So we all move along this timeline. This is how time is represented in relativity. We all move along this timeline from the past yesterday to the present today to tomorrow. Okay? Now, as space is getting twisted, what will eventually happen is that this that timeline will actually get twisted into a loop. So imagine that you take that, that line that you've drawn and you connect the bottom the top to the bottom of that line. So now you've made a loop out of that line, that straight line. Now you can see what's going to happen. If you start out on that loop from the line, that point that represented yesterday, and you continue along that loop to the point that represents today, and you continue along the loop further to the point that represents tomorrow. But remember, you've connected the top to the bottom of the line. So what does that mean? You could actually move that means from the future back into the past. So by causing a twisting of space, you can eventually cause time to become twisted into a loop. And along that loop in time, you can travel back into the past. And once again, this is all based, my theory is all based on Einstein's theory. So those are two different aspects. First, you have to cause the twisting of space, okay, uh, by the circulating beam of light. And Ultimately, that twisting of space will lead to twisting of time into a loop, and along that loop in time, you can travel back into the past. So that is the way you can use uh, general relativity, in my theory, to uh, travel back in time. Ron, let me ask you this. The, the events of, of time, past mm -hmm. and future, let, let's say everything I did yesterday, right. everything I'll do tomorrow, right? Is it recorded in some kind of dimension? Is it kept somewhere? How do you tap into it with time? That's okay. what I don't understand. Right. Well, you have to remember that in Einstein's theory, in a sense, it's all mapped out. Space and time are all there. That is to say that, that the timeline that I was talking about represents all those events that occurred in the past at the bottom of that line. And we, even though our consciousness, in a sense, you might say, evolved, along that. So it appears to us that there's an illusion of time passing, but the thing is is that it's already, you know, there in a sense, so that our consciousness moves along this timeline from the past to the present to the future. But in a sense, the thing that fixes it or changes it is by using matter and energy. That is to say that normally it would just simply pass. But in Einstein's theory, remember, that's, and this is the key, you can alter this passage of time by motion, and you can alter it by matter and energy. That is to say that you can get by speed, you can alter the rate at which time is flowing for you relative to everyone else. And if you use matter, you can bend space and time because it, 
space and time actually act like a fabric. Mm-hmm. See, so this is the thing that's intuitively hard to see. But the thing is, is that this is this is the revolution in Einstein's theory that the flow of time is not just something that happens; it's independent of us, but it's something that we can alter and change by motion and by gravity or bending of space and time. Now, how will you build the machines to compensate to do what you need to do? Okay, well, the thing is, is that, uh, once again, as I said, the first stage is to actually show that circulating beam of light will cause right. twisting of empty space. And uh, that's the first stage of what we need to do. And that, uh, as I said, I've developed the equations and theory. And what it shows is that the effect does not depend, it depends on two different things occurring, not just simply the intensity of the light beam, but also the size of the ring around which the laser beam is going. And it turns out that it depends inversely. What that means is that the smaller the ring, the greater the twisting effect occurs. So that means that if you make a very, very, very small, you know, circulating ring of light, then the twisting of space is very much greater. That's one of the reasons why the type of device we're looking at is not something that we're talking about sending people into. We're talking about things that sending subatomic particles and information in Mm -hmm. uh, because the smaller is the better. And in fact, the the real size of the device we're looking at in terms of using diode lasers is like, um, you know, the order of the scale of a human hair. Uh, But just to develop, uh, this is once again one of those things that, um, you know, people think, you know, every people have this conception of um, developing these things that come from movies. One of my favorite movies is Back <laughs> to the Future, you know. I love it. And love I, it. I love it, you know. With, and the, but, but, you know, real science, you can't go in the garage and with a DeLorean and come out, and, you know. Yeah, and, the, the, and the flux capacitor, right? Right, exactly. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a whole different thing. You need, you need. Uh, teams of people, you need expensive equipment, very expensive equipment, and uh, it takes time to develop this. And just the, uh, you might say, startup costs, because we have this thing developed in different phases, just to develop the conceptual design and outsource to a dial laser manufacturer, that is what would cost uh, about a quarter of a million dollars, just that portion of it. and then there's more. I mean, that's just simply, you know, the start That's up. just a little a segment. Is, is there, Ron, is there competition to get this done to time travel? Are there other scientists out there like yourself coming up with their theories, maybe similar to yours, who are trying to get this done too? Right. Well, the thing is, is that all of the serious work that's being done, that the serious work is anchored in Einstein's general theory of relativity. And yes, there are other people... Uh, however, they, uh, you have to remember, part of the reason why I was interested in it is I wanted to develop something that could be done um, by a direct manipulation of matter or, right. or energy, right. and I found eventually that, that by using lasers. The other ideas weren't motivated by personal concerns. They were more motivated by you know, purely um, intellectual Interest and one of the uh, uh, some of the other ideas, for example, uh, are based on um, using wormholes. Uh, this idea was developed by Kip Thorne at Caltech. The notion is is that you can actually um, build a time machine by manipulating a mouth of a wormhole. If you move the mouth around, it turns out that you can alter the passage of time around the mouth of the wormhole. And literally, if you come in from the outside of the wormhole into one mouth of the wormhole, as you go through the tunnel of the wormhole and come out the other side, then you could actually see yourself coming in from the other direction. So you, according to uh, Kip Thorne, you can use uh, wormholes as a possible time machine. Now, the thing is, is that wormholes are theoretically possible in Einstein's general theory. Uh, we haven't seen them yet. And the other thing is, is how does one, you know, create one? But uh, that's another aspect, but that is one of the ideas that are out there, one of the valid ideas. Another idea was developed by a man named Richard Gott at Princeton, and it has to do with uh, what are known as cosmic strings. These are uh, objects that uh, have been left over from the creation of the universe and the Big Bang. These are sort of uh, extremely long strands of matter that thread through space, and according to uh, Gott, Richard Gott, if you have 
two of these strings moving past each other in opposite directions, then they will actually create a swirling uh, pattern of space and time around them, and this, this, the a time loop will actually be created as the cosmic strings move past each other, and along that time loop, you could move back into the past. So uh, once again, it's, it's the idea is anchored in Einstein's theory that space can be manipulated, and uh, these cosmic strings can create these these loops. So these are just some of the ideas that are out there. So yes, there are other physicists who are looking at the possibility of time machines using other ways. But uh, mine was the the difference is, is to use light as the way of manipulating time. Is any of this dangerous, Ron? Uh, well, the, uh, dangerous only in the sense that um, once it's developed, once we have the technology, then uh, we have a possibility of abuse uh, because of the fact that one could utilize uh, time travel uh, in a way that could be uh, uh, detrimental. Uh, but that's just like any technology. That is to say that uh, all I have to do, of course, is just mention air travel. I mean, we can see the extreme benefits of air travel, but we could also just casually, you know, all we have to do is think of the 9-11 disaster to think oh, of, sure. you know, the abuse of, time, of air travel. So what will be needed is regulation when the technology comes online. We will have, it will have to be regulated. It's not something that can be used in an unregulated way. However, the ultimate benefit of it, I mean, imagine, and this is one of the things that um, you know, I, I talk about in, in my memoir, uh, Time Traveler, is imagine the benefit that one could have. Um, one of the things I did was I did a provisional patent for um, the possibility of a time machine. Uh, and, this, and what I did was to uh, use it as an early warning device. Imagine if we were able to have a way of warning ourselves of future catastrophes like an earthquake. Imagine the thousands of lives that we might oh be gosh. able to save. You see? Yes. So the potential benefits are overwhelming. So it, it's worth the risk because of the control that it will give mankind over its destiny that uh, has never been there before. If time travel is going to be possible, and, and, and you may be the one to come up with this and invent this, is it possible that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, time travel may be done by Dr. Ronald Mallet today? Is possible then, 50, 100 years from now, because of your efforts or somebody else's, and they have come back here? Can they be here now? Is that possible? That's, that, George, that's a very good question, and that gets to a core of a lot of uh, questions that people have about it. In other words, in fact, even of, at one time, uh, Stephen Hawking said, you know, if time travel had been possible, how come we're not inundated with time travelers? What one has to do is realize what the real physics of time travel involves. And this is important because you have to remember that it is actually the time machine, it's the device itself that creates this effect. Right. What I'm talking about, okay? So that means that if I turn the device on today, let's say, if I, was, if I had it created today and I turned it on and left it on for 100 years, then someone, it, it continuously left for 100 years, someone 100 years from now could travel back 25, 50, 75 years, all the way back up to the time the machine was turned on. But remember, it's the machine that is creating the loops, the effect. So they cannot travel back earlier than that because there's nothing there to materialize into. The, the effect isn't there. So what this means is, is that what it's saying is that with a real time machine, and no matter how one develops it, whether it's you know, with wormholes or using circulating light, it's only going to be able to go back to the point in which you turn the machine on. So... Um, so we can't go back and see Jesus, or you may not be able to go back and really see your father. That's 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 right. Not and I, I should the the caveat there is not with a terrestrial time machine. Now you might say, oh, why did I put that particular caveat in there? Right. Because of the fact that one of the things that uh, physicists know now very well since the nineties, we know that there are a great number of what are known as extrasolar planets. These are planets that are orbiting other stars, just the way our Earth orbits the sun. 
And even in our own neighborhood of the Milky Way galaxy, we've seen hundreds of these. And there are many of them that are very getting very close to being Earth-like. This means that uh, it's only a matter of time that we will find planets that are like Earth, supportable of life, that are orbiting other suns. What this means is that the universe is teeming with life. Okay? Now, some of these um, extrasolar planets and the life on them will be uh, more primitive than ours, but some of them will be much more advanced than ours. What this means is that on those planets, they may have developed time travel technology thousands of years ago. Yes. So imagine if they developed it, let's say, 10,000 years ago. Now, their machines will have the same limitation. Say, if they switched it on 10,000 years ago, one could only go back to that point. However, once we're a, if we eventually, and I do believe that we will eventually encounter these civilizations, once we encounter these civilizations, we could use our, their time machine to go back to our distant past. So ultimately, ah. our past may be opened up to us it's by just... extraterrestrial type of time machine. When, when, when Spike puts together your book, Time Traveler, and turns it into a movie, is, is he going to do it as a drama? Yes, that's right. Okay. It's going to be a regular feature film. It's not a, not a documentary. It's, it's actually uh, um, like other feature films that have been made of, of, of books. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, October Sky, which was made from a, a book called Rocket Boys, and also more recently, um, you know, A Beautiful Mind. Uh, right. So those that was made from a book also, but those were they were actually dramas based on the book. That is to say, that it will be actually the story. And my book is a memoir, and that's what attracted him to it. But it will be a drama. It will not, you know, it'll it'll actually be because uh, what he wants to do. So is, some, somebody will play you, for example. That's right. right? That's okay. right. That's right. Someone someone will play me. Someone will play my father and my mother, and you know, uh, it'll be right. It will actually be a drama. So who, do, who do you want to play you? <laughs> I knew that question was going to come up. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, is that unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I can allow people to speculate, but but you know, uh, I'm under contract now, and the thing is, is that <laughs> I'm not supposed to speculate on who should play me nor the time frame. I've got two movie. for you. Two that would be great: <laughs> either Denzel Washington or Cuba Gooding. Well, I I. I I think Morgan Freeman would be too old for you. <laughs> well, I, the thing is, is that as I said, I love the the the, the, the roles people speculate about, but, but for myself, I can't say directly. <laughs> for but you know, the thing that it, it's interesting um, how uh, the the whole thing with uh, Spike Lee, you know, came about. Yeah, tell us about that when we come back, Ron. That's that's fascinating. And the next hour. Yes, next hour we'll open up the phone lines and you can talk with Professor Dr. Ronald Mallett about time travel. We're going to take your phone calls next hour with Professor Ronald Mallett, but we'll be back with more questions for him in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Ron, so how did filmmaker Spike Lee get the rights to the feature film and how did that all come about? Yeah. Well, George, right you, to the, you right might, to be, the might be fascinated to know that your program had a bit of a role in that. Believe oh, it or really? Not. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's one of those, like, highly improbable connections that make you think about, you know, how things happen. Uh, it turns out that uh, a writer for um, the show uh, This American Life on NPR yeah. heard an interview of me on Coast to Coast, and he became very fascinated by that interview and decided to do This American Life episode on me. And it turned out that a re-airing of that broadcast just happened just this past February, and Spike Lee teaches film at New York University, and two of his students heard the This American Life broadcast and decided to get my book, uh, Time Traveler. And they read it, and they said, whoa, we should take this to, you know, to Spike. And they, you know, told him about my book, and he was going to be giving uh, a talk here at the, uh, univer at the University of Connecticut. Uh, he was invited by the university to give a talk, and he, uh, the, I, I still remember the day. This was like at the end of March. The physics department contacted me and said, 
Spike Lee wants to talk to you. And I said, <laughs> yeah, right. I did. Yeah, I thought, really? this, is, this is, you know, April Fool's joke. Yeah, I you know, sure he does. Yeah. And uh, exactly. And, but, and then he emailed me you know, directly, and said that he'd like to talk with me when he came up to the university. So we spent two hours before he gave his talk, and he was, you know, asking me detailed questions about, um, you know, my life, and I gave him a copy of my book, and he was um, going to be going back to Italy. You know, he's finishing, he's finished the film. It's going to be coming out um, in the fall. It's uh, called The Miracle at Santana. It's about the African-American buffalo soldiers who fought in the Second World War oh, in Italy okay, against okay. the Germans, okay? And uh, uh, there's trailers for it. It's going to be a great movie. In any case, uh, so he took the book with him, and he said, you know, he'd get back to me. And I thought, well, yeah, you know. So about a week and a half later after he came back, you know, he called me on the phone. And he said, this book is great. He said, I'm going to make a film of it. And then it was just like... Hollywood. He said, I'm going to have my people call your people and uh, leave both of you out of it and then uh, cut the deal. (laughs) Well, the the thing is, is that he he was behind all the way. He was he was shepherding to make sure everything was happening and happening rapidly because the deal happened far faster than these things usually happen. I found out from from my agent. And uh, and the thing is, is that he uh, this planning, I mean, the, we've signed the contract, and the uh, uh, the official press release just came out uh, a, a few weeks ago, and it's been, you know, to me, it's still an unbelievable dream that uh, That's a gifted, brilliant filmmaker, you know, wants to make a feature film, and, and it's, you know, and the thing is, is that in my, and when I've met with him, uh, it's very clear that he wants to make something that is going to be inspirational and entertaining, and he's very socially conscious. I mean, he's, he's funny. He's both intense and laid back in, in the way in which he is. And, uh, you know, I really respect him as a person, and it's clear that he wants to make something that is going to be uh, exciting for the general public and inspirational and as, as well as, you know, something that's going to inspire African-American youth as well. Well, and, well, we know Clint Eastwood won't be playing your part with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting interesting little, you know, <laughs> you know uh, so. well, that's exciting. What's the timetable? Well, that that's something that once again, I I'm, unfortunately I can't speculate about, you know, the timetable, uh, you know, but he's beginning, you know, uh, work on it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I got a call from him the other day that uh, he was deep into the research mode for the script. Uh, associated with so he's it's already you know I mean he's that this, he's going to be um, you know co-writing the script and directing the movie uh, but I don't you know I'm not exactly sure what the time frame is but things are beginning so uh, it, and as I said for me it's going to be as exciting as the general for the general public now I am uh, going to be the uh, technical advisor sure. for the movie but the creative part of it is going to be you know wholly his. And it's going to be fascinating to see what he does with the story because, as I said, um, it, it's the, the memoir portion of it with the time travel story. And I, a lot of people don't realize it, but when I wrote the book, I, I did not write it to be a science book. That is to say that there is science in the book, but the book is basically a memoir. And what I do is I try to take people on the journey as I learned it and lived it. In other words, I take them from my childhood and I develop the ideas within the context of the story. So I tell about uh, the things that happened to me personally uh, when I was in the service and what happened when I was in Mississippi, which was before the Civil Rights Bill, and and I take them on the personal journey. But I also build in how uh, Einstein's theories really allow us to understand time travel. And I also talk about other things as well as black This could be an Oscar run. This could be an well, Oscar for whoever plays you. It, 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 it could be. I, I really you know, feel that it could be, especially in the hands of, of someone like Spike Lee. Uh, it, it really could be. I, I really loved it when the contract was uh, finished and my uh, uh, agent, uh, Paul Bresnick, said, see you at the Oscars. You know, it was, That's uh, great. Well, you know. if you shoot it in L.A., and of course I spend 70% of my time there, Come on by the studio, and we'll uh, ah. you know we'll have you on uh, right in the studio. That I would love to do. Yeah, that, that would and, be nice. Uh, that that seems like a real possibility. That they'll probably film it in Los Angeles, and they can make any university look like a university. For example, <laughs> that, 
you know, that's an interesting thing. I mean, there, there would be, of course, you know, being at the at, uh, University of Connecticut, I would like to have it, you know, done on location there. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. They could they can do a university anywhere. Uh, I suspect, though, however, since part of my story takes place in the Bronx and uh, Spike being, you know, uh, a got, New You've got to go to the you Bronx, know. yeah. But but uh, but it's hard to tell where things are going to happen, you know. So uh, well, that, that's exciting, and you know, my take of because it is Hollywood. I bet in this film you do make the time machine, and something dramatic happens at the end. That's my guess. That's how I'd write it. <laughs> yeah, well, George, I mean, you know, it's, as I said, you know, it's hard to tell, you know, well, but it's going to be it's going to be fascinating. You know, I, I, I've got to ask you about a story that has been going on on this network for years about a time traveler Ron named John Teeter. Right. He's he started off sending messages to Art Bell on his website and you know it then hit the internet and it became just a phenom. And the story of John Teeter, the time traveler from twenty thirty six, what's so strange about it is that some of his predictions, not all of them, but some of them seem like they can come true, the way events are unfolding on this planet today. Uh, it, it's a great story. And I'll tell you what's even stranger. I've interviewed the attorney for the John Teeter family who have, according to the attorney, a little boy named John Teeter. So he hasn't grown up yet. Mm -hmm. And and he says, George, they're real. And this, this attorney, I've played the interview on the program a couple times, He's real, and he's not lying. He's telling the truth. Uh, he hasn't met the family, but he says they're real. And, but but I can't put my finger on the story. I don't know if it's a publicity stunt. If it is, it's years old, and nobody's you know triggered it yet. Uh, but have you heard this John oh, Teeter yes, story? I, I have, and and the thing is, George, and, and this is key because my my students, you know, ask me about that, and now they actually get it. Remember what I was saying about you know this point of how come we are not inundated with time travelers? Yes. What I what I told them is is that when someone approaches you, and there have been other stories at that, that other places with other people, you know, coming back and, and yes. saying that uh, you know they should people should do this on the stock market because you know they have and I, it's I told my students to say this, you know, be polite and say, hey, that's interesting because, you know, show me your device because the thing is, is that you cannot materialize into nothing. So it, it, if, if it is real, the person had to have switched on the machine already and have had to have had it on yes. into whatever that distant future is. So unless the person can demonstrate, and this is the core of, real science, unless the person can show you the device, because they, they cannot have just simply projected themselves from the future to any time into the past. There has to be a device for the, the person or the information to materialize into, then just don't buy it. And that's the thing. I mean, that's real physics. So the thing is, is that uh, unless the person can produce the uh, hardware to show how, you know, that they... How he had, traveled. Yeah. Right then I would be highly suspect. The uh, Large Hedron Collider in Surin in Switzerland is uh, truly cooking up now. I mean, they've turned it on. They're getting it to work. It hasn't started yet, but they're getting its gears in motion, literally. What do you think of that? Is that going to create a black hole? I've had some scientists on who think, yeah, it could be. And then we've had others who say, don't worry about it. Yeah, well, the thing is, is that... Uh, there are two ways of looking at that. You have to remember that whenever you're doing any type of real elementary particle physics experiment, we're talking about you know quantum physics here, and there are probabilities. Now you have to remember that the type of energies that are being that they're talking about in this machine, these energies actually have been in cosmic rays. Now, the difference is, is that, and one reason why you want a machine like the uh, Large Hadron Collider is the fact that you can control these things, whereas in cosmic rays, they happen randomly. And 
But you have to remember that in the cosmic ray showers, there have been these events, and so far these events have not led to, you know, the formation of black holes or cosmic catastrophes on the Earth. The other point is, is that there's always probabilities of something really strange happening. Just to give you a specific example, and this is real, um, at the beginning of the atomic age, when the, the, before the first atomic explosion occurred, mm -hmm. there really was a discussion among the scientists, the, the physicists, and this was a serious, there, is, there was actually a probability that the atomic bomb explosion could, in fact, ignite the hydrogen of the atmosphere and turn our planet into one giant hydrogen bomb. Oh, God. You see, people didn't know that, but there was that finite. But remember here, we're talking about probabilities. What, how the probability of it was so low, but it was there. But it was so, there. That's right. But it was there. So, yes, something. So that's why when they talk about what can happen in a large hadron collider, something, you know, fantastically weird might happen. But the probability of it is so low that, you know, one need not think about it because it could have already have happened from the cosmic rays that, have, you know, as uh, phenomena that uh, occur in our atmosphere. So that's why I'm saying that uh, it's highly unlikely that anything disastrous is going to happen. Well, however, I think it's highly likely that we're going to see some exciting things coming out of the Large Hadron Collider because the purpose of the Large Hadron Collider is to, in fact, show the basis for uh, possible unification of the fundamental forces of nature. And uh, that in itself is a whole new exciting development. There's these so-called hypothetical, or well, let's say they're theoretical particles called uh, Higgs particles. And uh, the thing, they are, in a sense, the glue behind the unification. And uh, this, this is one of the things that physicists really hope that the Large Hadron Collider is going to be able to show, is to show us this, this, these, this basic glue uh, behind the unification. Then these this is, but what else may happen? Well, that's what's exciting about physics. I mean, the thing is, is that when we start uh, colliding these uh, beams of protons into each other, they could lead to a whole new physical phenomena that we hadn't even dreamed of, and this could lead to open up possibilities for us that uh, we hadn't dreamed of. So that's what's exciting. But as far as uh, the formation of a black hole or, or you know, some catastrophe that will cause the end of life on Earth as we know it, I, I, it's, you know, it's about as probable as when the first atomic explosion, uh, you know, thankfully didn't turn our planet Gosh, into a I hydrogen bomb. I just hope they know what they're doing over there. Oh, they do. I mean, but believe me, that they, they're they running the test and uh, they, they it's safe. And as I said, there's, they, they really, there's no chance of anything uh, untoward happening uh, except, you know, the usual engineering difficulties. But uh, I, I would not expect anything except for uh, some exciting new events occurring, but not catastrophes. Now I'm getting messages on who should play you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now Jamie Foxx and Will Smith names. So they're, they're rolling in now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, and it's, it's, it's neat that people are speculating about it. <laughs> well, I always used to tell people when I was working on a show that uh, got, came very close, and it still may be, and uh, they said, well, who do you want to play you? And I was saying people like Andy Garcia and somebody else, and then somebody picked some wretched old guy, and I went, no, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I love time travel movies themselves, too, and, and they, you know, it's going to be... To me, what's nice is that this is going to be something that has the elements of those, but it's going to be based on uh, real life events. Yeah, that that that'll be exciting. It, it really will. If you had an opportunity to meet with Albert Einstein, maybe uh, if you go back, you can talk to him. What would you talk to him about? Well, what I would do is ask him what he would think of you know the things that have been happening uh, in modern physics and uh you know he uh had some problems with uh with with quantum physics and uh and he had his own way attempts he was trying to unify the forces of nature and i would ask him what he thought of the fact that we would be able to now utilize his work for time travel and uh 
just to, to get his impression of, of all the developments that have happened and see if he would what he what he thinks of them, and but also personally, um, you know, the, the, to to thank him, to thank him for uh, having given us this wonderful new insight yeah. into nature that allows us to understand the beginning of the universe, for example, in the Big Bang, uh, to understand how we can use matter and energy to, um, you know, one talks about the atomic bomb, but remember that uh, there are many parts of this country that without nuclear power, we would not be able to have the energy that we need. Um, and the other aspects of it, I mean, you know, all these devices that we have, things that people don't even think about and take for granted, uh, PET scans. People don't even realize that the, that the P in the PET scan is a, refers to positrons, and those are, those are pieces of antimatter, and those are consequences of Einstein's theory. You know, so, so even the modern mod medical technology that we have is rooted in relativity. So it would be just to thank him for all of the things, all of the wonderful fruits and all of the, uh, the possible technologies that we have that were a result of his work. Do you imagine how good he'd be if he had a computer? Oh, my. <laughs> things right. he could do. I mean, I would look at pictures of him, Ron, with a chalkboard of figures written all over the place. I mean, if he had a computer and um, was very proficient with it, the guy would have been unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, is that I think that he would have been, uh, we, he would have done both. He would have used the computer and he would have used the chalkboard because he was one of these people that I think he, he liked being in the equations. You know, one of the things that, that uh, being a theoretical physicist is like is really like uh, being a, a musical composer. Uh, and the thing is, is that uh, it, it, there's something beautifully tactile about uh, the equations themselves. And for my own work, for example, uh, I actually get in there and do the calculation by hand uh, because of the fact that I, I like the uh, the play of the equations, the feel of the equations. It's actually like painting your thoughts in terms of uh, of these equations. So I think that he would have he would have used them to to amplify things, but he would have definitely still have, I believe, uh, you know, gotten in there with his his hands and his pencil and his paper as well. But yes, mm -hmm. he definitely would have, have been able to have been fantastic by utilizing. Uh, or modern computer technology, too. Well, that's interesting, too, that you say he would still use uh, paper and, and pencil or pen because so many kids nowadays, Ron, if you take away their calculator or the, or, or the adding machine at wherever they may work, they can't figure out how much change to give you. Yes. And that's sad. That's very sad. That's very sad. And, and, it's, and it's unfortunate because it is, you know, there is something about using your mind directly in the equations and, and, and doing calculations, which actually is, it helps. You know, your, the, the brain is, is really um, like any other, you know, uh, aspect of our physical body. That is to say that it needs to be exercised. And unfortunately, it doesn't get the center of exercise that it needs when you're using a pocket calculator. Stay with us, Ron. We're up next with the phone calls for you on Coast to Coast AM. Indeed, indeed, with our special guest, Professor Dr. Ronald Mallett, and we'll take your phone calls with him in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie with Dr. Ronald Mallett. Are there going to be any limitations once all the machinery is made the right way, Ron? Well, the only limitation really is going to be uh, as far as uh, how far you can go back, as I said, because of the fact that you're going to uh, have... Uh, the, the problem, and, and that I should mention, and I should emphasize this, what we are doing is not trying to show that people, you know, we're not trying to do this with people, we're trying to do this with subatomic particles and information. Uh, and even that, of course, is, is a huge advance. In fact, in some ways, being able to send information through time is even more important than sending people. I mean, as I said before, you know, you can imagine using it as an early warning device um, and to, you know, send information uh, scientific information back into ourselves. So uh, that's what we're going to be focusing on. But um, the other limitation, as I said, is the fact that you can't go back earlier than when you turn the machine on. 
And one of the other things is that what will happen when we finally do turn on the machine and develop it, that, that is, in itself is going to be an interesting aspect because um, when we get signals, you know, from the future, uh, there's going to be an interesting paradox associated with it. You know, and it, it actually goes back to uh, the so-called grandfather paradox that uh, people talk about in terms of time travel, and that will still be something that may be associated with this, which, you know, has to do with the fact that, you know, in the standard grandfather paradox, the notion is, is that if you go back into the past, and you do something like, for example, preventing your grandparents from meeting each other, mm-hmm. then if they don't meet each other, then they don't have your parents. And if they don't have their par- your, par- their, your parents, then they, your parents don't have you. So how could you have gone back into the past? <laughs> uh, you know, and so, the, the, of course, modern physics uh, gives one possible answer to that, and that has to do with quantum physics and the notion that um, our universe may not be the only universe. It may be just simply one of many parallel universes. And uh, this is actually an aspect associated with quantum mechanics. And, uh, and this is a real possibility, which says that, um, for example, when we go back into the past, we don't go back into the past of our universe. We go back into the past of a parallel universe. And in that parallel universe, you could do something like preventing your grandparents from meeting each other. Uh, you would just find yourself in a weird universe in which you had never been born, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you're there. But the other universe that you originally came from, it, that is not affected. So that universe evolves in a way that it normally would that gives rise to your uh, parents and gives rise to you. So the notion is, is that when you go back into the past, the past you go back into, you can affect that past, but it's not the past that you originally came from. So the question is, is that once we do start receiving signals uh, from the future, uh, are those signals coming from our universe? Are those signals coming from a parallel universe? And then we have to make a decision about acting on those particular signals. So there could be a fundamental uncertainty associated with that. On the other hand, it could be that uh, there is not a parallel universe, that the information that we're getting is really from our universe, and we really do alter the fundamental nature of reality in the future when we receive information, uh, so that even though uh, things seem fixed for us, reality may be much more tenuous than we had thought, but we're not going to know any of these things until the first machine is turned on. All right, to the phones we go. Christian in Michigan, first-time caller. You're on with Dr. Ronald Mallett. Hey, Christian. Hello. Hello, George. It is an absolute honor, and your program goes on in our past your format. Um, and, and Dr. Mallet, i just uh, like to say that um, I've listened to Spike Lee since she got to have it, and I'm sure I'll be enlightened by your work. And I have a question or two. Dr. Mallet, when going back to the future, are you prepared for falling in a situation that isn't futuristic like a cold, traveling in the middle of a battle, knowing every tool in the future could release you of uh, uh, your past? Now, are you disciplined once you get there? Um, uh, do, you, do you take care of the business that you need and leave with nothing? Uh, will people look at your clothing and think that it's different? Uh, products people will see, inventions not yet invented, giving yourself away. And I'd just like to add, and I'll listen off the air, um, why, why is time travel for us? Um, why is it time travel for us and for aliens? It's it's, it's it, you know, well, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is for us it's time travel, and, and for aliens, uh, they're just, you know, I, I don't know if we're comforted by our like spirits, but um, when they come in, back in time, they're aliens, and when we go back in time, we're time traveling. And I'll listen off the air. I'm just nervous, but I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. No, right, no, I, no the, the, the question is, is that uh, once, and, and once again, as I said, you know, um, that we're not dealing with human time travel and, and the work that we're doing, but, but let's just, you know, uh, say that eventually sometime in the distant future, uh, human time travel is developed. Well, uh, if time travelers do start, and once again, remember what I said, that there's a limitation that they, they can only get back to the point where the machine was turned on, but even within that range, a time traveler coming from the distant future to some point in the intermediate uh, region, after the machine had been turned on, um, 
they would have to be disciplined. They would have to be, uh, as I said, this is the reason, this is the notion that time travel will have to be regulated. It isn't something that can be used in an arbitrary way by anyone. So it's not something that would be open for uh, time travel tours generally. It would have to be something that would have to be utilized in a way that is controlled. And how that would be done by the government, uh, it's hard to say. Incidentally, one of my favorite movies is uh, Time Cop, which unfortunately doesn't get the publicity that it should. It's with Claude Van Damme. But it does deal with the notion of a time enforcement agency that, that deals with abuses of time travel. It's, it's, a, it's a fun movie. But in any case, that will be a problem. Now, as far as aliens are concerned, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I do believe that the universe is teeming with life, and probably some of these alien uh, planets have developed time travel. And if their machines can go back, uh, were developed much, much earlier. Uh, then we could utilize that. So, but time travel for them would be the same as for us. It's, but once again, you know, you have that problem of getting to that civilization, then utilizing their machine, and then getting back to our civilization. So uh, it's it's not going to be something that once again could be arbitrarily used by anyone, but uh, would be something that would be uh, just exclusively used by um, the government, probably. Okay, very good. International line, you're on the air with us. Where are you calling from? Hello. Hi, where are you? Um, I'm from Toronto. My name is Georgie. Hey, Georgie. Hi. Hi, how are you? Professor, I wanted to ask you a question. And the question is, you know when you hear of uh, couples driving down, mm -hmm. like they're going home or something, and it's like a three-hour drive, and mm -hmm. then the next thing they find themselves waking up 20 minutes from their destination and only an hour has gone by, and it's a three-hour trip? Do you Do you think that's like... They've entered another dimension, or and is it a form of like tra uh, time traveling? Well, I mean, the thing is, is that uh, to I me, it, it's it's hard to say what had happened to them because it, you would have to see, you would have to do it under control conditions because, or in a repeatable way, because. Uh, what do you mean it, control conditions? Okay. Well, the thing is, is that the, the the people recorded what it is that they experienced. Okay? okay, but what you would have to do is to be able to reproduce that. You see, one of the core things in, in science is reproducibility. That is to say that whatever experiment that I do is going to be, have to be able to be verified and done by other scientists as well so that they know that it really was done. So the, this, this recorded event, it's hard to tell what it is that actually occurred for these people because unless we can actually reproduce it, um, there's no way of knowing what really happened for them. And that's what I mean by that. So, so it's not clear uh, what may have happened to them. Uh, and that, as I said, so it's, it's open. And, and you, you might think that um, they could have been an, an ET with car and all. Well, the last time, I, said I one, saw one couple, and the last thing they remembered was a big light. They right. Were, they were an old couple. Well, as I said, once again, the, the question is, is that, and you have to remember that the human mind is an extremely complicated thing. And what is really external and what is internal is sometimes very difficult to, uh, to know. And that's the reason why it's hard to know whether this phenomena that occurred to them is something that is a mental phenomena or something that was really part of, you know, the objective reality of what actually occurred to them. Um, and that, once again, is the reason why I said that, that you would have to be able to, uh, to see if, if you could verify in some other way the experience that they had to know that objectively this is something that happened externally and not something that happened uh, in their mind. Do you see what I'm saying? Okay, let's go to our next wild card line. You're on with Dr. Ron Mallet. Eric, go ahead, Eric. Hi, uh, George, and hi, hi Professor. Uh, hi. Greetings to you guys. Excellent show tonight. Question about black holes and its effect on space time. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I'm calling on from I-5, and uh, what I wanted to ask is, um, suppose you took a giant fluorescent light bulb and you threw that giant fluorescent light bulb into a black hole. Um, if that black hole is going to spit that light bulb out the other end of it, um, it's likely that you're never going to see that 
light bulb ever again in the future. Um, could it be, could the reason why you're never going to see any matter of any kind be that because maybe um, that matter may be sucked into that black hole uh, at the um, speed of light. Um, could it be that the matter that's being spit out the other end is going much faster than the speed of light? And could it be? Because, could that be the reason why we just can't see anything being spit out the other end? Excuse me, I'm a little nervous myself. Oh, no, no, that, that's, that's quite okay. Yeah, no, you have to remember that uh, with the black hole, nothing, uh, once an object goes in, it cannot get out. So, in other words, nothing, nothing gets out. spit out, right? And you might say, "Well, wait a minute. Doesn't that, you know, what is? What about the conservation of energy here? You know, what's happening to that?" Well, you have to remember that when you toss something into a black hole, it actually right. gets bigger. So, uh, what actually happens is, is that that object becomes a the the energy of that object becomes part of the mass of the black hole. So, any time I toss something into a black hole, it doesn't just simply disappear into the black hole. The black hole actually becomes bigger as a result, more massive. So the size of the black hole actually increases when you toss something in. That, and so that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. So, in fact, these black holes that are in orbit around some stars, these, as the black hole is absorbing the matter of the stars of which they're in orbit around, that the black hole actually is becoming larger, and eventually it will swallow up the entire star that it's orbiting around and just become one large black hole. So black and holes intrinsically get bigger whenever they absorb matter. So when you threw in that fluorescent bulb, what's actually going to happen is, is that it's going to go into the black hole, not come out, but the black hole is going to get bigger as a result. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure, you are. All right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you uh, being on the program, driving on the 5 Freeway in Los Angeles, where I will be shortly. Time traveling. Maybe teleporting, Ron. <laughs> Hey, if time travel is possible, do you think teleportation is too? Oh, as a matter of fact, uh, not only possible, but uh, primitive experiments are beginning with that. I mean, this is an aspect of quantum theory. I mean, relativity and, you know, the two pillars of modern physics are relativity and quantum theory. And, and physicists now are looking at quantum teleportation and looking at the possibility of using uh, quantum physics to show that matter can be teleported. Now, it's not going to be exactly the way that you saw it in Star Trek, but ultimately we will be able to uh, teleport objects. So you, the, the, the interesting thing here, George, is that, that physics, as, we, as we're getting more and more understanding, we, it's leading to possibilities that in the past we thought of as purely science fiction. And as our technology becomes more and more sophisticated, uh, these things become greater and greater possibilities. You know, I'm really one of these firm believers that uh, whatever the mind, the human mind can conceive, eventually, through science and technology, we will be able to achieve. It may not be in the form that we had originally thought, but we will be able to achieve it. Okay, let's go to first-time caller. Another Eric, who is in California. You're on the air with us. Hey, Eric. Hey, guys. Go ahead. Hey, George, Ron. How are you guys Thanks. doing? Good. Hi. I have a concern that I wanted to bring up. Um, I was thinking about this, and I was really appreciating your uh, illustration of the um, tea, the coffee cup, mm -hmm. and the swirling water and the um, sugar thing. And I had not thought of that before, and I had not realized that uh, light could actually affect gravity like that. And I think that there's a possibility that when you create this machine, instead of sending something into the past, you might actually be creating a particle of matter that travels backwards in time forwards. Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, you bring up a good point, and I should have mentioned that. Uh, there is, in fact, uh, it, believe it or not, it will actually be easier to send something forward in time then it will be back. In other words, because you don't need to create the closed loop with the twisting of space. In other words, the twisting of space will actually cause time to become dilated, to slow down. In other words, so just the mere swirling of space itself will cause what's called time dilation, and that will actually lead to the possibility of sending matter into the future. And that will actually be easier, and that will actually happen as an earlier step than sending things back. Because right. Sending things back will require a closed loop. So, yes, the, the, uh, the circulating light will do both. 
the, the, but in fact, initially, the circulating light will cause a twisting of space and will allow matter to go into the future. So, so you're quite right. It's only as the twisting becomes extremely strong that eventually time will become twisted in a loop and then matter would be sent back into the past. But yes, it would be, uh, the effect would happen that things could be sent, would be sent into the future. Right. The, uh, the thought that I had was that you might actually flip particle of matter four-dimensionally, upside down. Uh, well, and turn it into a particle of antimatter. In other words, yeah. matter traveling backwards. And oh, okay. Oh. No, no, that's right. There, there, in fact, there's a theory by Richard Feynman that, uh, that uh, was developed a long time ago in connection with uh, relativity and quantum theory in which he speculated that antimatter is, in fact, matter traveling backward in time. Mm-hmm. In other words, what he showed... Uh, using the equations that he had developed, was that if you take an electron and you send it back into the past, the, the electron would appear to us as a positron moving forward into the future. Now, the difference here is the fact that what he did was he just actually changed the sign of time in order for that effect to occur. In what I'm doing, this effect should happen continuously, and you should be able to show directly by calculations how matter would be affected by going on this, this uh, time loop. And that's one of the things that I'm actually currently investigating using quantum field theory to see how that effect would occur. I would just make sure that the particles that you use are small in quantity and you have some sort of magnetic containment just in case. Oh, well, that, that probably will be part of the eventual experimental apparatus. What a great listening audience, Ronald, huh? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> They've they've all got their own little PhDs. Stay with us. Now, how do people get a hold of you? Do you have a uh, email address? Oh, yes. uh... As a matter of fact, yeah. Thank you. The my email address is r l m a l l e t t at aol dot com. That's r l m a l l e t t at aol dot com. And also, the uh, I have a website that's at www.physics.ucon, and that's spelled U-C-O-N-N, dot E-D-U. It's www.physics.ucon.edu. We'll be back. We'll take final phone calls with Dr. Ronald Mallet on Coast to Coast AM. On our next Coast to Coast program, Diane Morang joins us as we talk about psychic phenomenon and other dimensions. I'm looking forward to that. When we come right back, We'll take final phone calls with Professor Ronald Mallet on time traveling and Coast to Coast AM. Ron, you can tell you love what you're doing. I'm not sure what profession you would have gone into if you didn't go into physics. <laughs> well, I think that the only other area that I, I can think of that really is something exciting to me is uh, about the brain. Uh, I, I, I really, the human brain is extremely fascinating to me. And, uh, I mean, if, if I hadn't devoted my life to physics, I could easily have seen that I might have gone into neurophysiology just so I could understand the brain and, and how the mind is related to, the, to it. But uh, my heart is in my love and my passion is in physics. You sure can tell. Let's go back to the phones. Fast three hours. Doug in California. Go ahead, Doug. Hi, uh, this is Douglas in San Francisco. Thanks, as yes, always, sir. Mr. Nori, and uh, thank you, Mr. Mallet, for speaking with us tonight. Sure. Uh, um, I was looking at this more from the biological angle. I used to be a Department of Defense librarian, but the biology was a lot easier for me than the physics. But from the physics angle, to cover that part first, what always confuses me about time travel is if the machine is in a fixed position, whether we're sending information bits or people, then uh, once that bit of material is sent back in time from the future, then um, the planet Earth on which the machine is would have rotated to a different part of space. So the information being sent, unless directed or somehow attracted or anchored, would wind up in empty space where the planet Earth was. So I'm picturing your machine as a layman, as some kind of teleportation gate, kind of like a transceiver. And what I am curious about from that angle would be using the Star Trek analogy, they say that ultimately teleportation without a receiver might be achieved using something similar to a light beam, a single super atom, a particulate daisy chain. And if we were to try to use that 
temporal analogy using a kind of light analogy, then perhaps we could send the information back further from that we might not need a receiver, in other words, and we could send something back to the time when your father or my father was alive, because I am also interested in, in my love for my father. And, um, and from the biological angle, what I did in that regard was I had his DNA just basically biochipped, and that would be something if we could go back in time with an insertion agent or team to your father's time or my father's time when they're both very young, uh, artificial intelligence researchers have always felt that a Nemo chip or a mnemonic chip could absorb so much information visually that within a person's life, even if it's, if it's 100 years, with the amount of information we're able to store on a chip, it really doesn't take up that much space. So by the time your father or my father dies, if, we, again, we send in an extraction agent or an extraction team just to sneak into the mortuary, so to speak, and just <laughs> sneak out the extraction chip and then just come back with it, then if you've got enough DNA left over from that same extraction operation, you basically clone him and download his memories into the new clone. And basically, we bring your father back or my father back without risking creating a new parallel universe. Or All right. Thing. What do you think of that, Ron? What do you well, think? I think that the biological you know, thing that you're talking about is fascinating. Uh, that the, the notion of, of uh, you know, somehow you know, cloning my father is, is you know, to me, a fascinating notion. Uh, the, however, I mean, I, what I'm, uh, as far as the time travel thing, you brought up a very, very good point about, uh, you know, how does this thing work in such a way that things, you know, because we're moving in space that it doesn't materialize, you know, into space. And, and you have to remember that, once again, the way the device works is that when you, the device is turned on, the circulating light beam, mm -hmm. it begins creating closed loops in time. And the closed loops in time stack up on each other. Now, now if you think of a child's toy that's called Slinky, okay? I remember Slinky. Right. And let's Slinky. say you hold the base of the Slinky, and that's where the first time loop is formed, okay? And now imagine that... that that as the earth is moving, okay, you're holding the top of the slinky part, and those are the additional time loops that are being formed. So as the earth is moving, the, your, the time loops are adjusting in space as the earth moves. So that, let's imagine that you're holding the top of the slinky now over to the side where the earth is at a later time, and the base of it is where the earth was originally. Now remember, all those time loops are co collect connected to each other like the helix of the slinky, so that at some later time, you would, if you're starting at the top of the spiral of the slinky, you would actually be spiraling back along the loops of the slinky back to where the earth was originally. So. As long as you've left the device on continuously, you would be forming loops in space and time. And this, they, the loops in time would be adjusting to the position of the Earth in space. Like, as I said, like if you were holding the top of the slinky and moving it to adjust to the uh, successive position of the Earth. So that's why, uh, there's, that is why you would actually be moving back along the loops in space as well as in time, and this would allow you to travel back in time to the original position of the Earth. That's why, once again, you have to keep in mind that it's the device that's creating it, and it's the device that is moving with the Earth, and so the loops are adjusting their location at, with the, the Earth. So, uh, once again, you still would have that, that basic limitation that you wouldn't be able to go back earlier, and, but also, at the same time, it would be able to adjust to the location of the Earth so that you would always end up to where the Earth is at any particular point in space because of the connection with the loops in time. Uh, but however, uh, once again, considering you know, the evolution in technology, present technology, um, it, it, it's interesting to uh, your notion of, uh, of cloning, you know, uh, a parent uh, is fascinating. Now, once again, remember that when the first human scale time machine is turned on or even devices that allow information. Uh, I like to think of it as the fact that when the first time machine is turned on, we won't be able to visit our ancestors, but our descendants will be able to visit us. So eventually someone in the future may come back to their parent and 
do the sort of cloning process that you are suggesting. But that will happen after the first time machine is formed. Well, I had a uh, physics teacher in high school. His name was Mr. Kiefer, and he made it so interesting. And you're another one of those who just oh, well, thank you. make it interesting to come to class. <laughs> thank you, George. I, uh, thank you. Let's go to the phones again. Let's go east of the Rockies. Nehemiah in Florida, you're on the air with us. Hi there. Hello. Thank you very much for taking my call. Sure thing. Okay, doctor, as an African-American, I must thank you very much for oh, thank you. spreading the knowledge of everything to us because I have never really gotten proper instruction and have only gotten by meditation. I was told to be dyslexic and claimed to understand that I processed energy differently. And I believe that by purification of the mind, by believing that every breath is a breath of life and every breath out is an exhalation of everything negative and inputting proper thought and proper food and hydration, that we become time machines ourselves by genetic coding, by DNA, because we heighten our vibrations, therefore um, eliminating the separation and torture of death by hiding our vibration so that when the black hole collapses upon itself, it travels correctly. Hmm. Right. Well, the thing is, is that what I do believe is that we are, in a sense, all time travelers. And the thing is, is however, is that what, we, what I would like is to be able to control the rate at which we travel through time so that we can, in fact, maximize the... Um, potential of all human beings to be able to control their destiny in a way that we have not been able to and we've been prisoners of. I can and explain that, how. You know, and, well, I think that, that eventually that will happen and, uh, by using the laws of physics, and that's basically you know, where I, I believe that we are heading. Well, we have to change our frame of reference, as you were saying earlier. And mm -hmm. once we separate our frame of reference, we will start reliving the things that um, are shortening the loop and causing the energy to shorten and the vibrations to shrink and the separation to hurt, thus aging and death and all of these things, which are limited concepts which turn on the programming when we use the labels. See, I'm well, dyslexic, so I think outside of all of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the box. Right. See, and the box is a cell, which by geometry traps in energy rather than letting it flow freely. Well, well, there you go. All right, see? He's even puzzled <laughs> you, Ronald. He's good. Well, the thing is is that I think that ultimately the um, way in which we will, in fact, change our frame of reference is, in fact, by altering space and time. And that is the core of what it is that physicists are, are trying to do and what I'm trying to do is to utilize the laws of nature in order to alter our frame of reference so that ultimately we can control space and time. And the precise way of doing that will be by utilizing Einstein's general theory of relativity. And, um, and it will happen. We will be able to uh, control our destiny and alter our frame of reference Absolutely. through the laws of physics. Alex in Ohio, first-time caller. Hey, Alex. Hi, George. Welcome to the show. Hi. Um, I'm actually calling in regards to some speculation on Dr. Mallet's involvement with the Nine Inch Nails album Year Zero. There are actually some claims circulating that um, the album is actually pretty much what Dr. Mallet's been talking about as far as information being passed um, onto the, well, past, but um, through what they were calling mallet rings, which is pretty much um, the, the time loops created by the light that he was talking about tonight. And I was just wondering about his comments on that. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, I'm not familiar with this, this album. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, is that uh, these uh, rings, these, these uh, so-called mallet rings, would be what would be created by the circulating beam of light. They actually are closed loops in time. Uh, but they haven't been, uh, they've been created by my equations, but what we're trying to do is to uh, get the funding so that we can create them in the laboratory. Uh, first, 
as I said, the, the first thing we're doing is creating these loops in space or creating this twisting in space initially, and that's what we're actually trying to get the funding to do is to do the space twisting experiments first. But, um, yeah, I'm not at all familiar with this, with this particular uh, album, but it sounds like uh, they are utilizing uh, the basis on which uh, I developed my theory, and uh, sounds interesting. <laughs> Okay, very good. Time for a few more calls here. Let's go to you, Mo, in Texas. You're up with us. Hi, Mo. Hey, how you doing, George? We're big, great. Uh, big fan of your show. Big fan Thank of your you. show. Uh, yeah, the question I have for your guest is, uh, sir, you seem like you're a really nice guy. You seem to have a very admirable uh, uh, task in front of you, and I appreciate the fact that you're going through with theoretical, theoretical science, excuse me, and I don't know why you're not being funded fully, but... The question I have to you is, if and when you're able to accomplish what you're wanting to accomplish, are you worried about the ramifications of what could happen doing this? Uh, I, of course, I mean, I'm concerned about the possible abuses, uh, but as I mentioned uh, earlier in the program, that... Well, uh, so... main, mainly for yourself. Oh, for myself? No. I mean, well, the thing yeah, is, is you... that... Oh. Oh, yeah. No, no. Right. I'm not worried about, about it for myself. I mean, my, my main concern is what is possible for mankind. How is it that I can possibly help advance mankind and do things that will right. actually benefit us all? So that's my main concern. And my uh, only possible, as I said, uh, concern in, in, the, you mean in the negative would be the fact that there's possible abuses that would be associated with it, but uh, I feel that that's so with any technology, and so regulation would be necessary. But to me, that is far outweighed by the possible benefits. And so that is my main motivation and my, uh, that drives me on, is trying to understand the basic nature of time, but also the possible benefits that it could bring to the uh, human race. Okay, very good. Next up, Karen in Texas. Take it away, Karen. Good morning. Um, thank you for taking my call. Of course. My question is along the same lines. The tendency to, to go back to uh, previous history and kill somebody like Hitler, who unfortunately did horrible things. But if things like change history, then could the world support the numbers of that would be born. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that I think that you ha one has to be careful to think about the fact that uh, by uh, should should we be concerned with uh, overpopulation because of the fact that we uh, help uh, people to have uh, better nutrition? I think what we have to do is we have to just think about the ways in which we can do that in a positive way. That is to say, that uh, you know, uh, helping people plan their other uh, families so that they have, uh, you know, fewer children rather than, uh, you know, uh, trying to worry about how, uh, what, what the effect would be of saving the, the children. So to me, one should always think first of, you know, saving life, and then one should think of just how one can intelligently, you know, regulate the, the population. So for me, that would be the better, you know, the more positive thing would be uh, uh, how can we save life, but how can we also uh, improve the quality of life by uh, positive regulation, that is to say, smaller families, that type of thing. Uh, that, so that, that would be the way in which I would like to think about it. All-time favorite time travel movie is? Ah, The Time Machine. That, that's yeah. uh, the 1960 version of the time machine with uh, rod taylor that that is that's my all-time favorite and it's the closest to hg wells's uh original book that that's that really is my all-time favorite i love the scene where he was sitting there and everything was changing outside that window yes was that yes. cool <laughs> that, that that's one of, I mean, you know, it, it's funny, but that's one of the best parts of the movie is as he's traveling through time and watching things. And, and they did it in such a beautiful way by having the mannequin and changing the style of, of the clothes, of her clothes through time and everything. Like, it was just done in a brilliant way. And it did win uh, an Academy Award for the special effects in that particular movie as well. So, so, yeah. Science <laughs> is fun, Ron. We, I had uh, 
the greatest opportunity to interview before he died, Don Herbert, Mr. Wizard. Uh-huh. And uh, what just what a wonderful guy. And it's just, I'm glad that you and people like Mr. Wizard and our little zany Dr. Morgus can share their love of science with so many people. Well, thank you. I mean, it, to me, it's a privilege to be able to do that and to, you know, it, because it is. I mean, it's exciting. And, uh, and it, it really, and I, and thank you for, you know, giving me a chance to, uh, to share my enthusiasm and the progress that we've been making in understanding time and uh, the, the excitement that I feel personally about Spike Lee uh, making a, a feature of Time Traveler. Hey, will you get to that point? Uh, bring him on the show with you, and we'll do a little update on the movie, okay? <laughs> I'd like to do that. like to do that? Okay, you, you know, you've got an open key here, Ron, so anytime you open the door, come in, come in anytime you want. Well, thank you very much, George. All right, you take care of yourself. That's Dr. Ron Mallett. And for Karis Coburn, Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Laudasur, Ross Mitchell, George Nappy, and Punnett and Art Bell, I'm George Norrie. Somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM, we'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.